Okay, so um, this week I wanted us to learn a primer in deep learning and genomics. Um, I had actually started reading this paper before um, I realized that um, uh, my turn to speak at lab meeting was coming up. And so I thought this would be uh, perfect because we're working with Tangram, which also, which is like a deep learning based package. And um, I have also been trying to like explore this area a little bit more in um, using R and maybe branching out into Python and stuff like that. So um, this was, a, I thought this was a pretty good paper. Um, again, I'm not too learned in this field. So if you feel like you might know something that I don't, or if I say something that's wrong, feel free to chime in at any point. Uh, I'm open to whatever. So um, I'm going to begin by giving a quick little overview on what machine learning is. Of course, I'm sure you guys already know this, um, but just to make sure that we're working from the same um, level. Uh, machine learning, it, it, it's a way to predict. Machine learning is basically a way to use models to predict, um, pr make predictions. Um, I think you can also call it predictive modeling in a sense, but I'm sure there's like nuances between those two terms. Um, and broadly speaking, as I'm sure you are aware, machine learning comes in two different flavors. They're supervised, unsupervised. Supervised machine learning relies on labeled training data. And, and depending on what kind of supervised machine learning problem you have, like whether it's a regression problem or classification problem, you either output continuous values like numbers or categorical values in a classification problem. Um, and then there's also supervised uh, machine learning problem. Un sorry, there's also unsupervised key difference. Unsupervised machine learning problems where um, you're not giving the model any sort of um, labeled training data. Uh, instead, you are feeding a bunch of data into a model, and then it, it then it attempts to produce certain insights into the fundamental structure of the data set that you gave it. Uh, if you've ever done a principal component analysis or looked at a principal component analysis, you know what I'm talking about. It's sort of clustering um, inputs into the model in a way that um, tries to demonstrate how similar they are to each other um, in the case of principal, principal component analysis. Um, and then if you're using a supervised learning model, uh, you uh, typically split your data set when developing into three, sometimes two, sometimes three, depend, depending on who you're talking to, um, different subsets. You have the training data. Some people do a validation split. Validation splits are designed to test your data against the, uh, or sorry, to test your model against a subset of your data um, as you're developing it um, or as you're training your model so that you know how to best tweak your model. Um, and then there's the, um, testing split. Um, I'll get to this a little bit later, but validation splits are also used to prevent um, overfitting. Um, and so the goal is to maximize uh, predictive performance on unseen data, which is why you don't want to use your testing split until the very end. Um, and there is the issue of overfitting and underfitting, um, which are two extremes that you want to avoid. In the case of overfitting, um, you want to avoid having too high of a performance, uh, predictive performance on your training data, because that means that um, in the future, the model will not be able to perform as well on unseen uh, um, data, won't be able to generalize. Underfitting means that your model is too general. You're basically spitting out a flat line. The data can't present itself. Um, I found this pretty cool meme. I'm going to inject a meme right here in my presentation. Um, uh, I thought it was pretty cool on Twitter uh, that explains overfitting. This is a good way to think about it. You know, just because you sleep, just because someone who sleeps in a bed in a position doesn't mean that they're always going, every person is always going to sleep in that same position the whole night. Um, so um, that's, that's it on the overview. Um, going into deep learning, it's deep learning is kind of like you can think of it as a subfield within machine learning. It's a, it's a method of machine learning that usually implements neural networks. Um, and the most basic component of a neural network is like a node um, or a neuron, 
which is where it gets its name. And the difference between that and more traditional machine learning methods like, you know, uh, gradient boosted trees or whatever is that uh, deep learning methods are, are, have a much greater capacity and are way more flexible. Um, you can reconfigure it, reroute the uh, model, add layers, remove layers. Um, there is a lot of different things you can do to the network architecture that you can't or you know, otherwise would be more difficult to do with more traditional machine learning methods. Um, and the way it works is that you feed a vector of data into each uh, input node, and then it uh, computes like some sort of weighted average of those um, of those vec of those values, and then does a nonlinear transformation on them. You know, that's as much as you'll be able to get out of me on how they work. <laughs> um, but uh, I, it's pretty cool. Um, and uh, the, the flip side of using machine learning methods, or sorry, deep learning neural networks, is that on the flip side, you have to use like more curated, well curated um, input data. Otherwise, um, you run the risk of um, overfitting, and that requires like a certain amount of domain knowledge. Um, and we'll get we'll get to that later. So um, they they these neural networks they take in tensors. Um, and that's like usually like matrix data, time series data, video data, anything that can be converted into like um, matrix vectors or, or, or matrices or, or layers of matrices, stuff like that. Um, a little bit about training and loss. Uh, you, you have, you have um, your training set and for each input X, each ith input X, you have the ith output Y. Um, and loss is the calculated, um, the sum of errors or the calculated difference between the predicted Y value when you're testing and the actual Y value. Um, and the lower the loss value, I, I guess you could say generally the lower the loss value, the better. But again, um, you know, if you're, if you're training, you don't want the loss to be like perfectly zero because then you have, you have overfitted. Um, so in neural networks, uh, you, you, you train, you train the neural network by taking the derivative of, um, uh, uh, of, of the loss value and then back propagating it, you know, updating the weights associated with each node in the neural network to, uh, reflect that loss. Uh, and, um, in, in tandem or in, in parallel, you want to be using a uh, validation data set. So that once you notice that the validation data set accuracy, the accuracy of the model on the validation data set is going down, uh, you stop training because then you are entering into overfitting um, territory. And this picture on the right, uh, this was not, they did not talk about this concept in the review, which I thought was um, surprising, but this is um, a 3D visualization of stochastic gradient descent. Um, this is another way to think about how a neural network updates the weights in a network, uh, which is that if you imagine the, the ball as like the efficacy, I guess, of the model, you want to like gently at, at each, um, I guess, iteration of the model, you want to gently push the ball in the direction in, in, in the most immediate direction that like reduces error without getting stuck in a local minimum. This is everything I say so far makes sense because I feel like I've been going very fast. We're good. I'm going to keep going then. This is a figure from the uh, paper itself. Um, and it kind of gives an overview of what it presented as the general workflow for uh, using a neural network. So you have you, you have your overall data set. Um, you you want to curate the data, which um, doesn't really represent here in this image, but you want to like ac somehow account for confounding variables within your data. Again, we'll get into that later. Um, and you want to split it into your training validation test set. You feed it into a neural network uh, architecture, whichever you're using. Um, I'll get into the different types later. And then you evaluate and you either produce like this, this, which is 
um, I believe called a confusion matrix, which shows you the ratio of true positives to false negatives, false positives, true negatives, et cetera. Um, or it, it gives you precision and recall values. Um, and in the paper, they say if there's like certain class imbalances that you can't fully account for, it's good to use precision and recall as um, a way of measuring the efficacy of your model over accuracy. Um, and then you want to interpret the results based on your domain uh, knowledge. Um, speaking of which, it's meme time. Um, this is something I, I think we all run into as bioinformaticians. Um, having to choose between coding skills and domain knowledge. We have a basic understanding of many things in the field of genomics. Maybe we have our own specialty, um, but we also have to further research things that we don't know. And as specifically bioinformaticians, we have some coding skills, but we're not computer scientists. So um, we're kind of like figuring it out as we go along. At least that's been my experience so far. Um, and I would say that fortunately for our, where we are, um, at, at the stage where are we, we're, we're kind of more interested in testing, using tweaking and providing feedback on others software than, um, than developing our own, although that might change, uh, in the future. So, uh, you know, you, you can push one of the two buttons. I think, I think you can comfortably push either coding skills and domain knowledge. Um, but you have like multiple, you know, it's not an apocalyptic scenario. You have multiple opportunities to hit the button. Okay, so there we are. Welcome back. Um, so I just wanted to go through the paper, um, kind of like the same way Nick did last week. Um, just kind of go through the paper and touch on parts because, um, like I said, and, you know, it might be obvious, I am far from being like a, an expert or even like having an intermediate understanding of this field. So um if you have any i might have some questions if you have any um like answers just let me know um in this paper they kind of they they cover the three types of um neural network architectures and i just kind of wanted to mention it because uh they refer to it again throughout the paper but i feel like i didn't get i didn't fully i wasn't able to fully understand like based on their one or two sentence long explanation, like what they meant, like feed forward. Okay, I get it. That's like the, probably the most simple, um, the simplest uh, way to compose a neural network. And here I found this cool resource um, that I Googled. Uh, okay, all right, yes, feed forward. It's this one right here. You can see that it's a very simple, it only has one hidden layer. It's only one layer deep. So you have the input layer, you have the hidden layer and then you have the output and it, it's very simple um it was invented you know like 70 years ago when they were doing all this stuff on paper um but then convolutional neural networks and recurrent neural networks it was hard for me to kind of wrap my mind around it um just reading the paper a neuron is scanned across an input matrix and at each position of the input the neural network computes a local weighted sum and produces an output value okay Cool. Um, and then this, this like example, how they tied it to genomics, it didn't make any, didn't make much sense to me in particular, but um, it did kind of help finding this, um, this uh, diagram. Um, of course, this is a convolutional network that's many layers deep, but um, it, it, it takes, it has multiple input, it has multiple input nodes. Um, it takes it in, it, it's, you know, anyway, that's something maybe that's a little bit more advanced for our purposes. Um, and a recurrent neural network, um, what I could glean from this diagram is that neural, recurrent neural networks has have nodes that kind of feed into themselves um, and sort of like repeat the, um, the weight that it gives to the vector being fed through it. Um, and um, I don't know if this here says um, uh, mainly used then context is important when decisions from past iterations or samples can influence current ones. The most common example of such contexts are texts. A word can only be analyzed in the context. Okay, so they usually use 
recurrent neural networks, I guess, from what I could glean reading this passage, um, it's, it's, it's good for like instances where context is important. Anyway, uh, um, they refer, so, sorry, me, go on. Let me try to um, give it another go here. So um, the, um, um, wait, can you scroll to where you have the networks? Yeah, sure. Picture, sorry. Um, yeah, so beautiful word is like, you have one input, you give it to the next uh, layer, right? And um, it says here that like, you're just connecting the, uh, the edges by having different weights, right? So maybe you're saying like, oh, um, let's say we have, um, you know, two nucleotides and we wanna know which is the important one, right? And so maybe the what our network will do is give a weight of zero to one um, nucleotide and then and then I want a weight of one to the other one, right? Mm -hmm. That's that would be like a simple example there. The convolutional neural network, there the idea is, um, uh, it's in a lot in, in a lot of things that we do in genomics, we're doing them in windows, right? So let's say our input is actually like the um, all the nucleotides across the genome, right? So we can represent that as a, a matrix that has four rows because of the four nucleotides um, across the full genome. That let's say is like three billion pace, uh, three billion columns in length, right? For our matrix, mm -hmm. and so we only have zeros and ones. And maybe what our what our uh, network will do is. For a given column, it's just gonna uh, choose, let's say, the neighboring ten um, nucleotides. So, like, let's say plus, we're doing a plus minus five window, right? So, at every single position, we take the first the uh, five closest upstream nucleotides and the five downstream uh, closest nucleotides, right? And so, at this point, then you're having something. It could be maybe you're computing the sum, right, or the median, right? You have something there that you're calculating, but now you're calculating in a window across like all your input, right? So um, if we have like windows that are that small, right? Are like 11 base pairs total, like that's gonna be a ton of windows in our genome, right? Um, like a more, you know, a big overview one would be like to calculate like one megabase windows instead of um, 11 nucleotide windows, um, stuff like that. Um, so, that's where this stuff comes into play for when you're trying to find like sequence motifs that are like short sequences in the genome that are used by um, proteins to recognize where they should uh, bind to in the DNA. Um, this is because you're repeating all these uh, window statistics and then you're gonna find like, oh, this is the window that like best matches it, right? Um, that's uh, how they're tying it to the, um, to the position weight matrix of a motif, right? Um, I don't know if that helped or not. Yeah. So, so in your example, convolutional neural networks, they would you sh they would like, for example, be used to detect like certain motifs, and then like would they would they then be able to detect that same motif in other windows? Or I wasn't I wasn't able to fully understand like I, the, it definitely helped with the way you explained it like I understand that like you are you are like feeding a sequence onto the um, you're like scanning a sequence like the way you're, you're described it made more sense to me but I just I don't know if I fully understand the example yeah um, so what yeah what you're saying is like a key about convolutional networks over like um, against just normal like feed forward networks is that the weights are shared across um the whole so i guess in this example the same weights would be like multiplied against each um section of the um, um of the dna sequence or whatever you're looking at so like it's it's looking for the same pattern across the whole um sequence and it's just going over in little um segments i guess I see, I see. Okay, and so it's finding like a, in this example, it'd be finding like um, a nucleotide pattern. Yeah, some pattern that has some sort of significance um, wherever it's located. 
So the okay. key is that it should be like a pattern that can be anywhere. Mm -hmm. um, whereas with like feed forward networks, the pattern um, it's looking for is going to be different depending on where the uh, like base pairs are, I guess. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, that definitely that helped. That helped. Um, okay, thanks. Thank you for that. Um, and then do you have any like, would you be able to do you have like an example for when like a recurrent neural network would be used in like a genomics? I mean, this this paper has several examples. Maybe we should just move on with a paper, and then we can like we can like unpack the examples it gives. Um, are we cool with that? Okay. Um, all right. So um, here it talks about curating uh, appropriate training data sets, and it talks about like uh, how if um, you're just naively applying a neural network to um, like a, a, a sequence or to like an entire genome or whatever, um, it would be able to detect these, this pathogenic genetic variant in um, like this, like a particular region, like, it next to like the exons of a genome, but it would not be able to distinguish that from the other type of region or the other type of variant, the, uh, the neutral variants uh, from the pathogenic variants because it's so successful at detecting the pathogenic variants in the exons of the genome every time. Um, so you have to uh, make sure to design data sets that are appropriately balanced for confounders. Does that, does that make sense? Okay, so um, genomics data are often highly imbalanced. Uh, again, they talk about precision and recall. Um, and domain knowledge is built into the design of the network architecture. It's just driving home the point that when you're designing a neural network, you want to um, have like a full thorough understanding of the problem you want to approach um, and build it into the neural network itself. Um, this is a very difficult color that I chose for this. Uh, but this is an example um, talking about a convolutional neural network. So they, they, they give an example of how you would want to take uh, domain knowledge to consideration when uh, designing a neural network. Um, so here they say that you want uh, the regulatory motifs that you're looking for have a tendency to be short. So you should define, design filters that are also small. Um, Uh, if the enhancers are being modeled, most of the activity is known to have a tendency to be clustered in regions from seven, several hundred base pairs to two kilobases. So you want to limit inputs to less than two kilobases. Um, so any sort of like, any way you design a network, um, you would be encoding your own, encoding some sort of bias. So you want to make sure it's like the bias that you encode into the uh, neural network architecture fits the problem that you're trying to solve. Um, and here, this was surprising to me, most genomics op applications, fewer than five layers are sufficient. Um, that, was, that, was pretty, that was pretty interesting, but later in, in, the, um, later in the paper, it talks about how um, in, for the purposes of mo most like genomics problems, like accuracy isn't even necessarily what is being sought after. It's more like discovering some sort of pattern, emergent pattern, or, or, or um, discovering some sort of mechanism. So um, I, I thought it was interesting. And they talk about how um, having like thorough, well-labeled training data and testing it against different, um, more traditional machine learning models uh, makes sure kind of like can add a level of being robust to your findings. Um, going ahead here, uh, yeah, the, here they talk about it's they're more interested and in, researchers are more interested in biological mechanisms revealed by the predictive models than prediction accuracy itself. Um, the main motivation for building accurate deep learning models to predict chromatin patterns is to learn new gene regulation grammar by interpreting the trained model as opposed to the accuracy of find like necessarily being very accurate in finding these chromatin 
patterns. Um, am I, is that, does that make sense so far? Am I, am I explaining it well? Okay, cool. Let's keep going. Um, so it gives another example um, and it's talking about how to interpret a neural network. Um, so for each data point X, each feature of X can, so it, here, here it's talking about how it's computationally less expensive to implement a neural network for um, detecting like the difference in outcome between changing like each point of a sequence, each um, point of a mutation or sorry, each the, the difference in outcome in each point mutation on on like the the output of the net on the output of the learning model would be easier to use um, a, a deep learning model as opposed to um, like man, like for each point in a sequence changing the nucleotide and then um, and then and like computing the output. Um, and here it says the derivative can be comp computed in one back propagation pass, updating all the weights in the network, and then it conveys the sensitivity of the output to small perturbations in input features. Um, so, and then this is something that I thought was surprising. Apparently, a point mutation is actually like in, in, in the context of um, using neural networks, apparently, a point mutation is like a big. It's like a pretty relatively large difference. It's a it's a large perturbation to the input. Uh, so here they talk about different um, different uh, methods that have been developed to sort of compensate for this fact. Um, compensate for um, compensate for like the the differences the the changes in the inputs causing like large differences to derivatives. Um, and here it gives another, it, it references convolutional neural networks again. It's possible to visualize each convolution filter as a heat map or position weight matrix style logo image. Um, which given Leo's explanation of what a convolutional neural network is makes a little bit more sense. Um, and lastly, in this, in this section, they, they, they point out that you should not necessarily and in, infer in, in some sort of cause effect relationship um, through your findings and instead um, use it as a way to generate hypotheses. So here it gets more particular. This is where like they're talking about the actual applications um, in, in genomics, um, functional genomics in particular um, identifying, predicting sequence specificity of these binding proteins um, and, and um, other regulatory regions. Um, similarly, the transcription, the identif identification of transcription start sites as well as cis regulatory enhancer elements. Um, it's giving a bunch of examples, uh, many of which I'm not quite too familiar with, but this would be a good resource to look at if you were interested in finding um, like jumping off points or reading more about the sort of um, headway they're making into applying deep learning into uh, functional genomics. Um, uh, so here they gave another, they give another example. Um, so genomic specific, mod genomic specific modifications to the deep learning architecture are um, can be useful when using uh, these two uh, regulatory or sorry uh, recurrent or convolutional neural network architectures um, and so they give this example of someone who found that um, when they used a naively applied like or it, they, they describe the phenomenon of naively applying a neural network on to um, like a sequence of dna and their reverse complement, and then getting to two totally different predictions. And so that's another example of if we are ever in the realm of um, developing our own architecture, um, bearing in mind that um, with these instruments, you have to um, you have to account for certain like biological realities. Um, and then here they talk about transcriptomics. Um, 
uh, you know, predictive models of gene expression from genotype data and, and, and um, splicing, identification of long non-coding RNA and, and detecting uh, DNA methylation. So these are just a bunch of examples of, of different like areas of, uh, areas of applying deep learning to genomics. Um, and and um, they even go on to say that people are fully just predicting, attempting to predict phenotypes from genetic data. Um, yeah, so uh, yeah, I mean, this this was a pretty interesting, I don't know, does anyone have any thoughts or, or um, just about this section alone? Like, I just thought these were some pretty interesting examples. I don't have much to add to them other than that I liked reading about them. Um, this I thought was particularly fascinating, like the functional consequences of non-coding variants. Um, <clears throat> Anyway, this is the next section is a bit more um, practical. Um, they talk about using GPUs, um, using cloud services, having to set up, you know, how difficult it is to set up CUDA uh, on a cloud. Um, uh, here, if you ever wanted to use like uh, some like, and, and like Nick and I have used this for Tangram. Um, uh, if you ever wanted to like use deep learning, like some sort of deep learning code, but you didn't have a GPU to run it, you could always use Google Collaboratory, which is like, um, like a way to like run Jupyter notebooks, um, which contain like deep, like, like, like deep learning packages, um, such as like Keras or Torch. Um, and then, and then here they talk about how like, uh, you're, they're fully like eliminating like the need to even code anymore. Um, you can just piece together like what you want what you want to do like building blocks or like some sort of flow chart um, and, and get reliable results um, yeah I mean this is this is this is uh, kind of um, stuff that you could independently look up if you were interested tensor flows from Google torch a new version of torch was recently released um, natively for R so it's not even like um running through reticulate but is instead like uh coded from a low level to be compatible with r um so uh yeah, yeah there is an opportunity to use that um uh Keras is the uh is is the most popular because it's like the most high level you don't have um you don't necessarily have to go and configure like um fine details of like the neural network you're trying to build um, and then they talk about like dragon with two ends. It's like a toolkit to teach and learn about deep learning for genomics, um, which yeah, might be something I'm going to look into this, this review itself had, um, an interactive tutorial to build a convolutional neural network to discover DNA binding motifs. I did not have a chance to use it. it, it it's definitely something I'm going to look into later, but, um, I don't know if anyone else played around with it. Um, and then here they kind of tie it off by talking about potential. Um, they kind of sum up the challenges of using deep learning systems, um, like making medical decisions. Um, for a challenge of how to, uh, yeah, okay. Avoid biases, stuff like that. I mean, I'm not gonna just, I'll, I'll, I'm not, I'll try not to like just read it out loud for you. Um, most successful applications of deep learning in genomics to date have been supervised learning. Um, and they reiterate that the high prediction accuracy is not the ultimate objective. Um, yeah, here they talk about automatically generating new DNA sequences with new proteins with desirable properties. Um, that's something I would want to read into later. Um, but overall, that I, I, I thought this was like a good like um, introduction, beginner's introduction into like how to look at using um, like neural network architectures in uh, the field of genomics. So yeah, I mean, if you have any questions, I'll try my best to answer them. <laughs>